What is up there guys, this is Cobb, and while Final Fantasy XIV has been a rather nice and easy and slow paced game to get into for a brand new player like myself and like Wifey, there have been a number of pretty gosh darn harsh lessons that, for a humble sprout, were pretty painful learning experiences. So I thought that in this video, spoilers ahead by the way, I'm warning you guys now, I'm not going to be holding back the spoilers because it's more fun to talk about some spoilery stuff. Um, so there will be some spoilers leading up until around the, uh, the end of Stormblood. So you're being warned. I thought it'd be pretty fun to talk about some of the rather harsh lessons that a lot of new players will be kind of backing into or coming up to, you know, as they get into the game and experience things for the first time. Also took some suggestions from you guys in the community tab as well, so thanks for those, we'll be weaving those in as we go. So harsh lesson number one! This one's pretty predictable, but learning what a stack marker is. Learning what a stack marker is. Yeah, so the Nidhogg fight, it's the first real stack marker at least that I encountered. Uh, maybe I missed some that showed up earlier on in the game, but Nidhogg that fight was the first stack marker I found, and I was pretty happy to see that a lot of you guys were commenting on that video. Like, oh my god, Lamau, he, he got destroyed by the stack marker, you know, because yes, I got the stack marker, I tried to run away, I thought I was helping. <laughs> I wasn't helping. I ended up basically fucking wiping half the raid. So that was good, and it's the kind of mistake that I guess you only make once, you know? So it definitely qualifies as one of the biggest and most harsh lessons, you know? But going back to the original point, it was nice to see a lot of you guys commenting below that Nidhogg video that I uploaded saying, yeah, this is pretty much a rite of passage. Every Sprout has to learn eventually what the stack marker is. Some of you guys were like linking memes and stuff and there's a bunch of memes on YouTube from it. Why are you running and all of that shit, you know? So this one had to make the list. Stack markers. Hash lesson number one. Hash lesson number two. And this one was kind of submitted from one of you guys in the community tab. And this one is that not all lives are equal when healing. Now I haven't played healer yet, uh, so I haven't experienced this one firsthand, but it was suggested from one of you guys, and I think that it's a really, really good point to take. Uh, this one was suggested by Mr. Farah Joachim. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably not, saying, just making sure you know your role and priorities, let people die if you need to, take care of yourself first, and then your tanks, DPS is not your priority. Yeah, this just seems like a pretty good one to learn for everybody, right? I think that a lot of DPS players even die in in raids and in trials and stuff like that and then they wonder why they're not getting resurrected and it's like dude just fucking let the healers do their thing okay stop raging stop qqing you died it's your goddamn fault okay you're a measly dps unless you have a combat res you're really not that high on the uh, priority list to be revived i actually considered healing for quite a while in this game i've decided against it i think i'm just gonna avoid it i'm just gonna stay away from it because honestly the pressure, the stress, okay? Don't QQ your healers, all right? Most healers, I think, know this rule of uh, of having like a kind of priority list of who they need to look after first in the group with their own lives being the most precious and any extra stress you add to them. I mean, you're just a walking meme at that point. Don't QQ your goddamn healers, bed. <laughs> I mean, maybe some of them deserve it, but as a general rule. Hash lesson number three. And this is one that you learn kind of early on-ish. We get into a little bit of spoiler action territory at this point. So you've been warned. And that is that Lalafell just ain't all that cute, man. Well, okay, they are to look at. But the more Lalafell you meet as the story unfolds, especially through, you know, the end of A Realm Reborn and through Heavensward and stuff, it's like, man, these, these Lalafell, they're little bastards. They're little bastards, man. You guys warned me about this shit. You were like, man, don't trust the Lalafell, man. Because I made a video talking before about how, you know, it's one of the, like, uh, it's just kind of like a habit for a lot of players to go around and forward slash pet Lalafell, you know? Just because, well, they're playing Lalafell. Oh, look at that little guy, you know, get a little pat on the head. No, man, Lalafell are bastards, okay? Yu Yu Hase, Lolorito, Teleji Adeleji. Man, you know what? I don't think I'd ever say this, but even Tataru's got a bit of a mean streak in it, you know what I'm saying? Tataru's got some craziness going on, especially when it comes to money and gil. But Yu Yu Hase, dude, Yu Yu fucking Hase, let me tell you something. I can't wait till we catch up to that little bastard. He's still being brought up in the plot every now and again, just kind of name dropped uh, throughout Stormblood. Oh man. Oh man, that tells me that eventually we will see that little fuck again. 
and I am gonna cab stomp that little bastard and it's gonna be great man now I really really hope that we do catch him up eventually and it's gonna be grand hash lesson number four and maybe this one was just hash for me because I'm the kind of guy who in my MMOs and in my RPGs I'm a big completionist I like to just I like to just do everything I'm not really bothered about doing like the hardest stuff in the game I used to be um, when I was a younger gamer and I had more time to put into these things but now I just want to experience a wide berth of things right I want to do everything <laughs> a casual hardcore gamer if it can be called such a thing yeah if you're gonna do that in Final Fantasy 14 plan four or five years in advance you ain't gonna do everything man this is something that again I've had to realize personally myself a little while back I think it was like a couple of months ago I was talking about things that I want to do in the game I want to level all of the professions all of the crafting jobs I want to level all of the jobs all of the classes I want to do all of the side quests all of the blue quests experience every dungeon every raid every this every that collect all the triple triad cards you know all of the sightseeing logs all of the hunting logs all of that stuff yeah next expansion's coming up it's going to add a bunch more stuff on top of all the things that I want to do you know it's like dude realistically with how long I actually have to play per week which really isn't that long I'm gonna be here for like at least another three or four years man maybe longer because in three or four years who knows a new expansion might be rolling out as well you know so yeah if you're a completionist gamer a harsh lesson is gonna be that you got a long fucking road ahead of you <laughs> harsh lesson number five Player houses get demolished if you don't visit them often enough. This one was a submission from Mr. Zenovus, who said on the community post, If you get your hands on a house, the owner has to enter once in a while, I believe it's every 30, uh, 30 days at the moment, or your house will be demolished and your land put up for sale. Now, again, this isn't something I uh, experienced myself just yet, but I know and have heard anecdotally that the housing market and the housing trading scene and stuff like that is extremely fucking competitive extremely competitive um i've heard that there are even like dirty games that are played and stuff in order to uh for players to be able to acquire houses um and keep a like a monopoly on the system stuff like that and there's all kinds of uh there's all kinds of shady stuff that goes on you know so i don't know too much about it other than i know that it's hyper competitive and once you get a house you hold on to that shit like it's the most fucking precious thing in your life because it might just be and so yeah while i haven't experienced it myself i imagine it is a pretty fucking harsh lesson for you to log in one day after taking a month off and seeing that your house is just gone and some other some little lala fell called yu yu has fucking moved in and you're homeless <laughs> i can imagine that being pretty feels bad harsh lesson number six if it looks like you can fall off the edge in a boss fight you can fall off the edge in that boss fight. This is one that you learn kind of early on with Titan, and it's kind of like a general rule that uh, goes on and continues with, uh, you know, dangerous edges around the sides of the boss pit. Um, starting with Titan going into like Shiva, and then like uh, Shinrayu and Xenos, they kind of have these mechanics as well where if there's a ledge you can fall off, you can probably fall off the goddamn ledge. And it's not just that. Well, Shiva actually doesn't really have that exact mechanic, but there's certain other boss encounters as well where this uh, mechanic sort of exists, where if it looks like the ledge is dangerous even, like the spiky things around it or shadowy tendrils or, or there's like fire there or, or something like that, chances are the boss will almost definitely have some kind of movement altering mechanic you know so with titan it's a straight up knockback with uh, the xenos fight in the alamigo dungeon um he has like knockbacks and like pushes and pulls and stuff like that you know so that kind of thing can happen basically if it looks like the edge of the boss chamber is dangerous in some way expect movement altering mechanics to be in the fight it's good to know if you're going in blind well, if you're watching this video and you and you closed it because I warned of spoilers coming up, you're not going to know about this, and so you're probably going to die versus Titan, which is fucking hilarious. But there you go, man. Hash lesson number six. Hash lesson number seven. Moving straight on. This is one that I added. A realm reborn does not end after the Praetorium. Why is this a harsh lesson? A realm reborn just isn't that great compared to, I mean, look, man, look. I'm sure it was like okay for the time. It does a good enough job of like setting the stage, but the pacing is kind of glacially slow. <laughs> and I think that a lot of people, uh, even people who are like really diehard fans of FF14 and, and love every aspect of the game and really immerse themselves in it, 
most people can still admit that, you know, A Realm Reborn was understandably a step lower than the expansions that have come later on, especially when you set it up against the likes of Heaven's Ward. I mean, goodness me, uh, is the difference, you know, night and day when it comes to pacing and writing and stuff. And so it was with great dismay that I realized that, yeah, A Realm Reborn, it doesn't end with a Praetorium, it doesn't end with those ending credits. <laughs> you still got a fucking long way to go, and it's a, it's a hell of a slog, man. It's a hell of a slog. I actually saw somebody in the, in the little Sprout chat, I forget its name now, the Novice Network. The Novice Network, right? I saw somebody asking, okay, so, um, I just finished Praetorium, like, when do I get to Heaven's Ward? And it was like, yeah, like, the post-patch content for A Realm Reborn, is basically as long as the content that takes you from level 1 to 50. Just again, you know? And he's right, man, it goes on for so long, the post-patch slog, so that's definitely a harsh lesson. You learn it the hard way, you get like another 20 hours after the ending of A Realm Reborn, and you're still in A Realm Reborn, and you're like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah, you got a while to go. It's sad, but there it is. Harsh lesson number 8. Equip your bastard jobstone. This suggestion comes in from Jirai underscore YT, saying, I've done it twice now, but jobstone. Equip it! Stop running around with half of your abilities. Uh, thank the kind people in FF for helping me. So this isn't one that I've done myself. I found that, I think I watched like a Zeppler video a long time ago when I was first starting off the game. I'd been playing for a, a few weeks and I learned about the jobstones and I was like, oh, Man, I'm so excited to get my job stone that I really couldn't forget it, you know? So as soon as I got it, I equipped it right away, and that's grand. But I've heard about people doing this, like, leveling to max level without ever equipping their fucking job stone, and they have no idea what they're missing, you know? Nobody's, nobody's spotted it, nobody's just told them, and so there they are, you know, max level without a job stone, man. So don't worry about it, man, Jirai. Not only are you not the only one, but at least you were warned about it, you know? <laughs> at least people helped you out, man. It didn't let you go all the way through the game without you ever equipping this goddamn jobstone, man. See, that's why you don't rush through this game too quick, man. You're gonna miss stuff like equipping your goddamn jobstone. It's a disaster. So this one's a little bit more wiggly. It's not exactly a harsh lesson, but it's something that you should definitely learn, especially if you're coming from other games. Um, and it's perfectly exemplified by this comment from Zibrion. Uh, but the lesson is effectively that the game doesn't begin at endgame. The game does not begin at endgame. This is something that World of Warcraft has become kind of notorious for over the past, well, let's be real, like eight or nine years, <laughs> where the game is effectively endgame and everything before that, the living experience, is just something that you blaze through as quick as humanly possible, you know, or at least a lot of players do that. You know, there are some who like to take the time, but I definitely feel like they are in the minority. But Sir Brian puts it like this, the game doesn't start at endgame. Coming from WoW, this was the hardest thing to unlearn for me. You can have fun, do relevant things that are outside the very uh, endgame raids. And it's exactly correct, man. I think that honestly, our boy Asmongold is the best example of this. It's like, even with the very limited amount of time that I have to play week on week, um, this dude spends like two weeks three weeks, you know, at the end of every expansion, just like checking out mounts, doing fly, uh, the, like gold saucer shenanigans, um, checking out all of like the extreme raids and extreme trials and stuff like that, and, and doing all of that fucking stuff, you know, and farming the gear, and that's the way it's meant to be, you know? Now, unfortunately, if I was to do that, with a very limited amount of time that I have to play, I'd probably still be in, you know, the beginnings of fucking Heaven's World right now. And maybe a lot of you guys, like, maybe a lot of you guys would say, that's fine and stuff, that's fine, you know, take your time, there's, there's no rush, there's no that. But at the end of the day, I do kind of want to progress to the main story. Right now, the main story quest is the main reason I play the game, which is why I'm just kind of pushing through ahead with that, and I will eventually go back and do all of that other stuff once I am at uh, max level and fully caught up with the story. So. That's my plan, but this advice, I don't think this can be reiterated enough for WoW players that come to the game and just blaze through as many quests as they possibly can every single, and like they're not reading it, they're not watching any cutscenes, they're not reading anything, they don't give a damn about it, they're just trying to get to endgame because they're locked into this mindset that have to get to endgame, have to get ready for the new expansion, must get geared, must be competitive, you know, and it's like, the difference with WoW and FF really is that WoW is an MMO, FF is an RPG. I mean, they're both MMO RPGs, but WoW is an MMO first, and FF is an RPG first. At least in my opinion. At least in my sproutly opinion, you know? So there you go. Hashtag number nine. 
Game doesn't begin at end game. Hash listen number 10, gosh darn it. And that is that you only experience the story for the first time once. So this comment came in from Mr. Victor, and I'm kind of glad that I put this one last just coincidentally because uh, it just kind of relates to the point that I just made about FF being an RPG first and foremost and an MMO uh, second, or it's very, very secondary, you know, to the actual gameplay cycles that you go through. Um, and Victor puts it like this, FF14 is a fantasy adventure which happens with you right here and right now. You don't need to wait for something, you can just enjoy it in a way that you like it. Even if this is just a game, the memories will stay with you and I'm so grateful to the FF14 developers who make this awesome game and to other players who make this world so alive and so awesome. The only thing which I regret is that I can't wipe my memory and start this adventure over again. God damn it man, comments like this and points like this are making me so not scared to progress with the story. I just want to make sure that I'm soaking it all in because at the end of the day, I'm like coming towards the end of Stormblood right now. Or I'm in like the post content, you know, for, for Stormblood right now. And then after that, there's like uh, Shadowbringers, you know, and then the new expansion's coming out. And so it's like, I'm almost caught up to the end of the current uh, main story, you know. And I don't know how I feel about that. I just hope that, well, this is part of the reason I like recording so much, actually. I must have like 300 gig of just shit <laughs> of clips of me and Sophie reacting to cutscenes and, and character moments and cool story moments and stuff from all of the games so far. Uh, just saved on my external hard drive just for the memories, you know? And there's a lot of them that, and I'm never going to upload them to YouTube, but I'm just kind of keeping them for myself, almost like a little, uh, little adventure album. You know what I'm saying? So, I totally get this. I get this point. I mean, at the end of the day, there are still going to be players who just want to kind of skip ahead and just say, well, you know what? I just don't have time to watch all of these cutscenes. It's all too long, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, okay, again, I mean, if that's the way that you want to enjoy the game and you do enjoy the game that way and it works for you, then by all means. But I think that the default position should be to try to at, le at least try to soak in the story as you go because I think at this comment does stand Ben. You only get to experience the goddamn MSQ once, really, and have it all be fresh, so try to take advantage of that. I know things can be really dry throughout A Realm Reborn, but it's effectively setting the stage for a lot of the characters that are going to become much more fleshed out with better writing and better voice acting and stuff in later expansions, so it's worth paying attention, man. It's worth paying some heed. You know what I'm saying? All right, and those are my top 10 picks for the harshest lessons in Final Fantasy XIV that all Sprouts must undergo, realize, and accept at some point uh, within the first, like, six months of playing this gosh damn video game. Drop any that you think we've missed down below in the comments. I'm going to wrap this one up with a long-ass comment from Mr. Hippo Potato who went ahead and listed like seven smaller uh, smaller lessons, I guess, that he feels are crucial for you new players as well, man. So here we go, dude. First of all, save glamour prisms by learning how to use the glamour plates. Yeah, I wasted like eight prisms, eight or nine prisms or something, just because I was a moron and I couldn't be asked to learn how to use the glamour plates. Yeah, watch a quick YouTube tutorial. It's totally worth it. It's going to save you a lot of goddamn prisms and you're going to have a grand old time. Next he says, at any of the big aetherites, you can open a sub-menu to quickly travel to any smaller aetherite in the capital city he's, uh, cities he's talking about. So that's a small thing. I think that was pretty self-explanatory. Next up, work on your squadrons ASAP. I don't actually know what squadrons are just yet. Maybe I should know what they are by now, but well, there you go. And there's a bunch of other small tips here as well, talking about how to spend achievement points and goddamn what's this... Kayoko's weekly fashion report for some easy MGP. I've heard about that as well, but I haven't patched in that myself just yet. Read your goddamn tooltips for spells. Lots of stuff here, man. So by all means, pause and take some notes if you're a new player that wants a helping hand, man, from Mr. Hippo Potato. You know what I'm saying? All right, thanks for watching, guys. I hope that you alls enjoyed this chatty little FF14 video. Gonna try to get back to making more videos like this in the coming days, in the coming weeks, and in the future. So, cheers, everybody. Thanks to everybody who has subscribed to the channel recently. It's been an incredible resurgence in subscribers. Thank you so, so much to all of you who hit the join button below the videos and actually choose to become channel members. That's incredible to see as well. It directly helps support me financially <laughs> so I can actually uh, justify putting time into, you know, creating these videos, man. It's been fucking 
amazing to get my ass back on YouTube, man, and get back to pumping out content for y'all. So, thanks so, so much, everyone. Have a fantastic day, and I shall catch all of you guys just a tad bit later.